Hi everyone, welcome to the final session before the keynote speech by Sam and Andres. And uh, just a reminder to the speakers, every speaker is given 20 minutes to present with a 10 minute of question round. So without uh, further ado, I warmly welcome Masha Mramlie, I hope that's the correct pronunciation, from the University of Edinburgh. And she's going to speak about Disappointed Hope and the Egyptian Revolution. Looking forward to it. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mati, and to the organizers of this conference. It, it's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity and also to everyone uh, for uh, joining to listen. So yes, uh, my paper today is entitled Disappointed Hopes. Um, uh, 10 years after the revolutionary upheaval, the Arab Spring in Egypt has come to signify a betrayed promise of liberation. Many activists themselves remember the uprisings with a sense of profound disappointment, bemoaning their naivety and recklessness that, that guided their younger selves. The troubling political implication of this uh, is that the Arab Spring has become not only a symbol of the failed revolution, but it, it is now held up uh, as a, a repudiation of the very notion of protest. The danger, to paraphrase Lida Maxwell, is that the sense of disappointment over a particular instance of failed resistance leads into a sense of failure of resistance as such. Now, this in turn uh, calls for hierarchical forms of governance to offset the inherently flawed character of political engagement by the people. Yet in this paper, I want to argue uh, that the Arab Spring in Egypt can also serve us as an exemplary case where deep disappointment over the lack of social and political change did not mark the end uh, of activism uh, or a hope for a better future, but instead inspired creative efforts to confront the complexities of resistant action. So uh, uh, I want to position myself against this fatalist narrative of the futility uh, of resistance and propose uh, to explore the politically transformative potentials of disappointment. And specifically, I focused on the way uh, this deep disappointment is articulated by resistors. I interrogate how the experience of disappointment can affect the resistors' horizon of hope which I'm understanding in this uh, phenomenological existential sense as our uh, pre-reflective sense of future possibilities. Delving into the political value of the resistor's disappointment, I contribute to the literature in political theory, politics, and international relations on the significance of emotions for social movements. This examination, I propose, can upend the still dominant perception of disappointment as a demobilizing effect and illuminate the political potential of disappointed hope in the aftermath of pervasive repression. repression. To that end, uh, I theorize disappointment as an existential feeling, a drawing on Matthew Radcliffe's notion of existential feeling, uh, which means um, a way of being in the world. This existential understanding of disappointment offers insight into the experiential lived reality of disappointment as an experience of disjuncture between the hoped for utopian future and the complex realities of sociopolitical change over time. This allows me to explore how disappointment as an experience of disjuncture unsettles our habitual ways of relating to the world and others and reconfigures our horizon of hope. I argue that the resistor's disappointment can lead to what Ernst Bloch called educated hope. So um, by this, I mean a hope embodying the fundamental existential human impulse to imagine a life otherwise, which however has undergone the learning experience of disappointment and is aware of the unpredictability uh, of the future. On this account, a lapse into cynical despair in the wake of failure constitute the mere other side of naive optimism. And this is because it likewise stems from an unwillingness to make oneself vulnerable to disappointment. Disappointed hope, on the other hand, I argue, incorporates the awareness of the contradictions, complexities, and uncertainties of social and, of so social and political change into the very mode of imagining an otherwise. 
Thus, I propose this appointment can reconfigure the resistor's horizon of hope along the following three axes. First, I argue that this appointment can unhinge the utopian impulse from the pre-given goal and direct it towards a persistent, ever reborn striving for greater freedom and justice. Second, I argue that this appointment can redirect energy towards a practice-oriented negotiation of the concrete possibilities and limitations of political action. And third, I argue that this appointment can lead to an openness towards the genuinely new that is predicated upon the willingness to bear the risk of failure. In the paper itself, I look for the practical articulation of disappointed hopes in uh, the selected first-hand memoir uh, of the Arab Spring uprisings in Egypt, uh, which is entitled Cairo, uh, a memoir of a city transformed. It's written by a prominent uh, Egyptian activist and writer, Aghdaf Suaif, which in Egypt, uh, uh, she has herself become kind of an image, an icon of hope uh, in the face of failure. I argue that the memoir aptly shows how moments of disappointment did not uh, translate into despair, but inspired a new hopefulness about the however ambiguous potentials of political action in the present. I tease out how the resistors' disappointed hopes reimagine resistance as a constant process of uh, revivifying, reconfiguring, and diversifying the forms of revolutionary praxis in response to failure while refusing the lure of fa fatalism. Unfortunately, during this presentation, I won't have time to go uh, into uh, this analysis of the memoir uh, itself, but I will focus on the theoretical side of the ar argument. So I'll try to unpack, uh, to trace how disappointment can uh, affect the resistor's horizon of hope. So going back to the three points that I outlined uh, before, first, I suggest that disappointment can redirect our hopes away from the pursuit of a pre-given end and towards a persistent, ever reborn striving for greater freedom and justice. This injunction draws from Bloch's tracing of the presence of utopia through its absence, positing the sense that there is something missing as the precondition for the positive realization of our dreams for a better world, even when the darkness seems darker than ever. As Miguel Abensur, for example, develops this claim, it is in the not yet that utopia finds its inextinguishable source. And it is in this not yet, this non-achievement of being, that we can find the mainspring of persistent hope. So on this account, persistent hope refers to a stubborn impulse towards freedom, towards justice, that is reborn, it reappears, it makes itself felt in the bleak bleakest of circumstances. It is, as Abensur says, as if the catastrophe itself ca called forth new summations. On this account, then, disappointment can give rise to a permanent struggle an always new upsurge where defeats, losses, and failures become sites of new aspirations. On this reading, disappointment dislodges the quest for the accomplishment of being, which would actually coincide with the end of the utopian impulse. Instead, a persistent hope brought forward by disappointment does not lead to a repeated pursuit of a determinant content. It rather resembles the ever reborn movement towards something indeterminate. While persistent hope may assume the form of concrete struggles, demands, or movements, it is not associated with a static, pre-given vision of change. Instead, the disappointment hope's persistence concerns the orientation towards what is different. Its virtue, as Abensur poetically surmises, is to wake people up, to tear them away from uh, their acceptance of the established order and affirm their ability to go beyond the given. Moving to the second point, I argue disappointment can redirect the resistor's energies towards a concrete practice-oriented negotiation of the possibilities of political action. This appeal draws from Bloch's awareness that the condition for the possibility of speculation lies in the material itself. Hope informed by past disappointments in this respect is educated in the sense that it understands that the possibilities for a better world are imminent within the material itself, 
even if the realization of these possibilities is not at all certain. Building on this, this uh, understanding, disappointed hope wards off the danger of our hopes becoming ensnared in mere fantasy. Instead, it embodies a practice-oriented commitment to real possibility, or real possible, as Bloch would uh, call it, that simultaneously anticipates and affects a future. As Ruth Levitas argues, it represents the transformation of wishful thinking into willful and effective acting. This shift is to be contrasted with the project of real utopia associated with Eric Olden Wright and his group of associates. This project of real utopia too is concerned with exploring the, potential the potentials for transformation inhering in the existing system. Wright's pursuit of real utopia stems from his realization that the capitalist system of oppression and exploitation is deeply entrenched and that attempts at ruptural overthrow are doomed to failure. What is needed instead, Wright says, are utopian ideals that are grounded in the real potentials of humanity. Yet this assessment of the current situation is based on a prior appraisal of vile alternatives, which betrays an excessive confidence in the resources of the hegemonic order to better itself, and all too easily concedes to what is feasible in the world as we know it. Thus, is, uh, it unwittingly betrays the emancipatory potential of disappointed hope. It sacrifices the radical possibilities for transformation in front of the real world of compromise and concession. Rather, the disappointed move towards concrete utopia can better be comprehended as an instance of so-called grounded hope. Grounded hope is likewise informed by a sense of limitations that the existing uh, conditions of oppression, for instance, impose on the ways of imagining and acting towards a better future. However, here, the emphasis lies on shattering the illusion of the necessity and the unchangeability of the status quo. Frederick Jameson, for example, speaks to this capacity of disappointed hope when he writes of utopian thinking as a strategy of disruption insisting that its radical difference is possible and that a break is necessary. Disappointed hope then may redirect our energies into contesting and pushing the boundaries of what is possible, broadening our sense of the alternatives which the hegemonic order has proclaimed to be unrealistic or utopian. By revealing the hegemonic power structures and their oppressive logics, grounded hope fosters an imaginative imaginative awareness of neglected or suppressed possibilities for qualitatively different or better forms of living latent in the present. Thus grounded hope opens us, opens us space for oppositional thinking and acting that experiment with the possibilities for living otherwise in the here and now. At the same time, uh, however, this practice of, of reflecting on the impossible, on the unrealizable, recognizes that the outcomes of the action are bound to remain unpredictable, incomplete and flawed, subject to ongoing negotiation of the constraining political conditions. And this point moves me directly into the third point. I argue that this determination to act within the limitations and contradictions of the existing system also leads to a different perception of failure. Disappointed hope, I propose, can lead to an openness towards the future that views the possibility of failure as part and parcel of our utopian strivings. For what it does is uh, it dispenses with a tele teleological view of history as progressive realization of a pre-given end, where failure is perceived as a lacuna or lack in the fulfillment of the utopian blueprint. Instead, the risk uh, of failure arises from the grounded hopes negotiation of the complexities of political action within the strictures of the existing system. Thus, failure is, see, is seen as drawing our attention to a plurality of marginalized possibilities constituting the fa fa fabric of history, which on the grounds of being unrealistic at any given sociopolitical, uh, soci sociopolitical conjecture have been eclipsed, rejected, or forgotten. 
Importantly then, this appointed hope does not view failure as a phenomena that helps define the, the boundary or the binary between the realistic and the unrealistic. This view of failure would consign those initiatives that failed or remained unfulfilled to the realm of the impossible. To the contrary, disappointed, uh, disappointment can shed a critical eye on the hegemonic attempts to entrench in resistors or in the general populace a sense of failure. So the sense that resistant action against the system can never work or be effective. More than this, this change understanding of failure also foregrounds an openness to the future, its risk and unpredictability. Understood in terms of marginalized possibilities, as uh, Clive Gabay, for example, argues, failure is seen as a site of beginnings that exceed themselves in unrealized ways, where inspiration for alternative political worlds uh, might be derived. This view of failure is uh, underlain by an understanding of the meaning of revolutionary praxis that is not judged in terms of its success. So it's not judged in terms of whether or not it has achieved uh, its uh, intended results or its intended goal. Instead, alternative worlds come into being in the process of engaging in revolutionary praxis itself, shifting the focus uh, away from ends and towards the means of uh, resistant action. This is a form of prefigurative politics, which is oriented to thinking the break from the status quo itself, rather than necessarily outlining a complete and coherent picture of what things would look like after the break. This understanding of utopian action allows us to uncover uh, radical possibilities residing within each break with the status quo, even if they uh, historically remained unrealized. Hope informed by past disappointments views failure as a political resource for the recreation of contemporary utopic praxis or projects and as a form of prefiguration with important afterlives. This should not be read as a defense of revolutionary martyrdom, uh, for instance, making light of the sacrifices and losses endured by those defying an oppressive system. Rather, it is past failures and losses that might open our imagination to the existence of alternative future residing within the past, inspiring us to continue working for a better world despite the possibility of failure. The motto of such disappointed hope, for instance, is well encapsulated in Samuel Beckett's injunction to try again, uh, fail again, but fail better. Here, failing better might mean coming to terms with and confronting the contradictions, tensions, and losses as inevitable parts of resistant action. In addition, it might encourage us to regard our actions as directed not only uh, towards our own present, but also to the future, inspiring future generations to take up our hopes in their own context. In the words of the German anarcho-socialist Gustav Landauer, we might see our position as one of the thousands of tiny decentralized beginnings on the path towards greater freedom and justice. So I'll end on this uh, optimistic note and I look forward to uh, your questions and discussion. Thank you so much. Thanks, Masha, for your thought-provoking and inspiring talk. And now the discussion round is open. Please type your names in the chat box. We, so if nobody has a question, I can start off. Uh, I think I was this, this disappointed hope as an emotion which moves and inspires people, I think is, is very interesting to think of. But I was also wondering uh, in the midst of turmoil and despair, political revolutions, there's, there's a very kind of thin boundary between cynical despair, as you mentioned, and disappointed hope. So what actually kind of lays the ground for this disappointed hope, because it can easily just turn the other way and make people very cynical. So what are your thoughts on that? Right, so I think you're quite right. And, and it is also an, um, a lived reality, right? That, that hopes, especially if they're perhaps too high, um, 
very quickly turn into despair. So there's this um, there's this uh, kind of a movement, right, from hopes into despair. But my my paper is not so much saying that um, that disappointment will inevitably turn into uh, a disappointed hope that can be productive, but it is to explore this possibility that. Um, disappointment, failure need not necessarily turn us into cynical despair. Just because, uh, as 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 it also comes out out of many memoirs of, of activists on the ground, um, it is precisely it is precisely failure that uh, encourages them towards further vigilance. For example, in the case of the Arab Spring protesters, it is being constantly betrayed by the regime who promised uh, that promised. Uh, everything will be different, um, but they had to fight for every single step of the way they had to fight. And I think it is in this, uh, in this um, awareness that you cannot be too optimistic, that you cannot uh, think the system will just change all of, the sum, uh, all of the sudden, that you cannot believe that you have this capacity of a master who can just change everything all of the sudden, that the revolution will just be one step. I think it is in this, that the resistors empirically, right, experientially find the grounds for continuing to hope, for continuing to resist, uh, for being open to the future, but without the guarantees uh, that um, would ground them, right, that would ground their action in any secure, absolute way. Okay, thank you so much for that. And next we have Andreas. Do you hear me? Okay. Um, well, great paper. Thanks very much. I really like this. Uh, and I just wonder whether one could complicate this a little bit further. Uh, it's already complicated enough as it is. Um, but immediately when you were talking about um, Bloch and others, um, I thought instinct uh, immediately about uh, Alberto Hirschmann's uh, book on shifting involvements. I don't know whether you heard about this. Um, uh, it's about engagement and disappointment. And what he does in the book, it's a very short book, it's only 160 pages or so, he outlines uh, that there is not a unilinear movement, but um, that there are phases where people who have been activists retreat into the private, but it's not a total privatization, but it's a more a moment to draw breath, to reflect and to re-engage again. So people usually do not just drop out um, you know, of one engagement and then maybe they're disappointed. Could well be, well, that's part of the process. But then you usually gather strengths by retreating into the, from the public a little bit and hence the title of shifting involvement. And it's also linked to Hirschman's notion of possibilism, which I think comes pretty close to what you want to say with Bloch about concrete utopia. Uh, and the final remark, uh, I mean, of course, there's the famous text by Rosa Luxemburg, uh, on the dialectic between reform and revolution. I always thought it was absolutely crazy to denounce anybody who was for reform or radical reform as a revisionist. I thought, you know, these times have long gone and that's a good thing too. Um, so I just wonder any, I mean, these are, you know, more, more comments actually or footnotes, um, but maybe a thought on Hirschman you might have or. Thank you so much, Andreas. This this uh, is really helpful, and I totally agree with you with your thoughts on Hirschman. They uh, um, they um, resonate really well with my account, especially when I go into the, the analysis of the memoir. That's exactly what Ardu also says: that at some point they needed a respite. They needed a, a res respite in the sense of a retreat to the private life that was not complete, right? Because the private and public were very much enmeshed in, in their case, because for example, both of my children, her son and, and daughter were uh, in prison. So, right, it was also going to the prison that she, where she constantly had to cross this boundary between public and, and private. Um, and it was a const constant fluctuation as well. Like you said, there's no unilinear movement. I completely agree with you. But I also think that um, perhaps some activists or um, victims of oppression do not get that respite of being able to withdraw into the private life. 
um, this is what I noticed when analyzing this uh, memoir, because obviously she, she is a radical activist, she has sacrificed a lot, but she also belongs to a relatively privileged member of the Egyptian resistance, so to speak, that can take that respite, that can go to uh, out of uh, Cairo, for example, uh, to, to just to just take a break for, from all the disappointment and, and everything that was happening. So I think both of these movements are, are very important here. Um, and uh, with regards to your question uh, uh, about Luxembourg, I'm so happy you brought her up because she's one of the main thinkers I'm engaging uh, uh, with, with in, in terms of this broader project about disappointment. And I think, so yes, she denounced Bernstein, but I also think that her account was um, sensitive to the fact that both of these um, that both of these um, attitudes were necessary, both uh, struggling for reform and a struggle for radical overthrow. She just thought that reformism then as a doctrine actually worked to uh, preclude a true revolutionary change of society. I don't know what your thoughts are, are, are on that. I'd be interested to hear what, what, what you think and how you, you judge her position, if there's time. Uh, well, I think it depends on the constellation, right? So, I mean, you know, the different moments. I mean, when it's about to, to boil up, you know, uh, and to, to come really to a radical momentum, and it's very hard to determine that, I would think. Um, you need a lot of, you know, uh, imagination to, to stir you through such a process. And uh, you might be wrong, you know, sometimes, I mean, this is always a possibility, you know. We might all be wrong. So, uh, who guarantees that we are always right? So, I mean, it depends, right? Mm -hmm. There are no laws in history, so. So now we'll move on to the next question by Philip. Actually, I think I would like to um, give my, give it over already to the next one, um, be, because uh, I've already asked so many questions in this conference and there's others on the list. I just wanted to say that I really, really appreciate you mentioning Landauer the kind of uh, crazy uh, uh, visionary, political visionary, but uh, it's nice to hear this uh, yeah, mention. But anyway, I would like to you know, give my question slot to Matthew. Maybe we can chat more some other time. Thank you, Philip. Yes. And I think I saw you smiling when I mentioned Landauer. Yes. I thought you might have a question about that. Thank you for the comment. Well, thank you, Philip, for, for passing it over to, to me. Um, I just had a question about conceptualization here, um, either your own or in the, the literature that you're dealing with here, um, specifically uh, on the idea of hope versus expectation. Uh, so you talk about disappointed hopes um, and, and that leading to possibilities uh, and, and, you know, something possibly positive to, to come about from disappointed hopes. Um, in the literature that you've explored or in your own, um, you know, thinking about things here, would there be the same, um, you know, positive possibilities coming from disappointed expectations there? Or would that lead to some other outcome potentially here, something more, uh, you know, radical, reactionary, whatever, um, just based on the difference between a hope for something as, a, as opposed to an expectation that something will unfold. Can I just quickly ask, thank you very much for the question. Uh, how, how would you conceptualize the difference between hope and expectation? Uh, so hope, believing that something could happen and you know, being favorably d disposed to, to believing that there's a real possibility there. Whereas expectation, I'd say is closer to you know, near certainty that this is going to happen. Um, this this is what the future holds here, and then if that future doesn't hold, there being you know that being more you know earth shaking or, or unsettling there for someone who didn't merely think that you know 
something possibly good could happen, but had presumed that it would happen in the future there. Okay, I see. That's really interesting. So I haven't made the distinction myself in the paper. Uh, when I define hope in the paper, I draw on a psychological and philosophical account that, accounts that understand it as a response, uh, that understand disappointment as a response to violated expectations. Um, but it, I, I imbue it with a more fundamental existential significance, uh, if that makes sense, where, uh, you know, um, something not happening that you expected will happen or that you work towards happening uh, also means a shattering of your sense of the world, of your world, of your habitual ways of relating to the world, and also of your sense of self uh, as someone who can affect a meaningful change in the world uh, in line with your expectations. So I, I understand hope in more this existential phenomenological sense where it's immediately related to, to, to your practical engagement with the world. Uh, but perhaps you're right, and I should make a, a clearer distinction but I'll, uh, between these two, right? Um, but I'll have to think about it further. Thank you for, thank you for uh, drawing uh, my attention to it. Thanks once again, uh, Masha. And sorry, Iram, we have to move over to the next session to keep up with time. And Thank you so have... much for all your questions. Thank you. And next we have uh, Matthew Slabok from the university, from Denison University. And he will talk about rethinking progress in an age of uncertainty. Welcome. So first, thank you very much uh, for, for letting me participate. Um, today. I really appreciate it. I'm sorry that I've missed uh, so much of the, the conference, but um, I'm, on, I'm on the wrong side of the ocean here right now, so um, not, not a lot that, that could be done there, but I, I am happy to, to be talking today. And what I'll be talking about is largely based on an already published um, book of mine, um, but it's a book that I've been rethinking here uh, and, you know, I, I will welcome any questions or, or possible um, ideas for future re research that anyone might have in the, the question and answer um, period here. But to begin, um, what I'm talking about here um, is less the philosophical side of, of my book and, and more some of the direct political um, things going on in, in the world today, but I will start. Um, so one of the most enduring political ads of the previous century appeared during Ronald Reagan's 1984 re-election campaign. In the television spot, Prouder, Stronger, Better, a narrator proclaims that it's morning in America. At any rate, that is the message that the Reagan campaign and the media popularized subsequent to the ads airing. In truth, the narrator had not proclaimed it to be mourning in America, but rather mourning again in America. The difference in phrasing here is subtle, but important. Consider what happens if we apply the mourning metaphor to American economic and social well being, as the ads makers clearly wanted its viewers to do. If it's mourning in America, then the future is ripe with possibilities. Presumably, citizens can look forward to such things as greater material comfort and more harmonious relationships in their communities. The again in the ad, though, is disorienting. First, it serves as a reminder of a dreary past, the dark night through which dawn had to break. Second, it augurs an uncertain future. If it's morning again, won't it be midnight again at some point too? So the scrapping of again in Reagan lore is perhaps unsurprising since, after all, the idea of a permanent resplendent dawn is more consonant with the optimistic vision for the United States that the 40th president sought to convey. There was no possibility of misconstruing the message of a would-be successor to President Reagan, Senator Barack Obama. 
As a presidential aspirant, Obama ran on a message of hope and change, a vision of a brighter future and a promise to implement the reforms needed to make that vision a reality. Four years later, as an incumbent president, Obama promised to take voters forward by continuing and building upon the policies introduced during his first term. But there was a marked change in the collective mood of the American electorate between the 2008 and 2012 elections. In 2008, the electorate ushered Obama into office with near universal acclaim and well-wishing. But by the end of his first term, the president found himself on the defensive. Voters who'd once shared his optimism had become despondent. Recognizing the changed atmosphere, Obama found it necessary to proclaim in his 2012 State of the Union address that, quote, Anyone who tells you that America is in decline or that our influence has waned doesn't know what they're talking about. He won re-election, but public uncertainty about the future of the United States remained. At a town hall meeting in June 2016, his tenure as president winding down and his legacy in question, Obama again proclaimed that, quote, the notion that somehow America is in decline is just not borne out by the facts. The debate about ordinary Americans' well being and their country's place in the world continued right into the 2016 election. Ostensibly challenging Secretary Hillary Clinton for the chance to succeed President Obama, Donald Trump made much of his campaign a referendum on Obama himself. He promised to undo much of what Obama had done as president, including repeal the president's signature legislative achievement, the Affordable Care Act. The message oft proclaimed by Trump on the campaign trail and emblazoned on many a hat in his crowds of supporters was make America great again. But this message had an ambiguity to it. If America needs to be made great again, for how long has the country been less than great? Did the rot set in during Obama's presidency or can we trace our problems back even further? And is this inglorious period, whenever it may have started, an aberration in an otherwise constant trajectory from worse to better? Or is it the downward part of a predictable cycle of progress and decline? Steve Bannon, candidate Trump's chief strategist, adheres to a cyclical view of history. Does Trump share this view? And what does it matter to him, to the American public, and to the world now that he has served as president and, and may seek that office again? There is a danger in overanalyzing campaign slogans or in, or in imputing a full set of beliefs to politicians based on the pithy messages that adorn the buttons or bumper stickers distributed by their managers. I've highlighted recent slogans though, because they share a unique feature. If taken seriously, each asks us to consider the nature and trajectory of historical change. As noted above, Reagan, as noted before, Reagan's morning in America theme had an optimistic ring to it, focused particularly on American national improvement. Obama's campaign of hope was no less optimistic, but, did, but it did not explicitly exclude countries other than the US from participating in positive change. Trump's up imploration to make America great again combined pessimism about current affairs with nostalgia for some unspecified past and optimism about the future. Which vision holds closest to the way change unfolds? Is progress a purely national affair or is it universal? And is it linear or does it follow a jagged path? Perhaps we have no reason to expect future progress at all. Maybe there is no inevitable march towards the right side of history. Those are the sorts of questions which I deal with in my book. Um, and 
For answers, I look not to politicians, but to an eclectic mix of historians, philosophers, and novelists. Cross national in scope, my book examines not only American writers, but German and Russian authors too. I am interested particularly in how philosophies of history undergird political theories. I present various optimistic philosophies and describe the political agendas with which they are associated, but I focus especially on criticisms of the idea of historical progress, which I suggest po political theorists have unduly marginalized. I argue that at a time of worldwide uncertainty about the future, we have good reason to study critics of the idea of progress. Whether we are ultimately persuaded by their ideas or not, we should reconsider what we have to offer, what they have to offer. The sense of pessimism or the rhetoric of the decline is really a pretty universal phenomenon. I can point to some examples from, from Europe, for instance. A 2015 Ipsos survey of citizens from nine of the EU's member states found that three quarters of respondents felt that the European Union was headed in the wrong direction. The EU gets a fair bit of grief, but surely citizens felt that their own countries would be doing fine, right? Not so. Um, another Ipsos poll from 2016 found more than 60% of Brits found the UK to be moving in the wrong direction, while 70% of Germans, more than 80% of Spaniards, Italians, and Hungarians, and almost 90% of Frenchmen found their countries were headed in the wrong direction. But Europeans aren't alone. Uh, Ipsos 2017 reports nearly two thirds of people around the world believe their country is headed in the wrong direction. These polls, of course, predate to 2020, which Time Magazine declared the worst year ever, uh, a year that began with wildfires ravaging Australia and California, saw a novel coronavirus emerge in China and then wreak worldwide devastation, uh, and continue with racial protests and a bitterly fought presidential campaign that laid bare the deep fissures that divide the American public. These events did little to raise morale. Almost universally, people think that their societies and or the rest of the world are in bad shape. So Americans are not unique in their pessimism. What is unique here is that for Americans, given our reputation as a land of optimism, feeling pessimistic is kind of strange. Um, so some might be tempted to attribute this pessimism to Donald Trump and his candidacy or his presidency. But remember, it was Barack Obama who declared in his 2012 State of the Union address that anyone who tells you that America is in decline or that our influence has waned doesn't know what they're talking about. Well, why was there a need to make such a statement? Because a mere 18% of the public was satisfied at the time that President Obama delivered his address. Why, four years later, did Obama feel the need to declare that the notion that somehow America is in decline is just not borne out by the facts? Well, in 2013, Gallup found that for the first time in 40 years of polling, a majority of Americans felt that their country's influence in world affairs was waning. And a sub September 2015 Bloomberg poll captured Americans' uncertainty pretty well, encapsulated in the headline, 72% of Americans think that their country isn't as great as it once was. Now these polls tell us that people don't feel we're currently progressing. What these polls don't tell us is whether or not people still have faith in the idea of progress itself. Present discontent and the widespread belief that we are not making, not now making progress do not necessarily imply a rejection of the idea that humanity can make lasting scientific, technological, economic, cultural, moral, and political advances. An idea that may yet still hold currency. 
even in a dispirited age. Indeed, the well-worn charge by partisans are of one stripe or another that their political opponents are on the quote unquote wrong side of history suggests of those who brandish it that they believe history should and does move from worse to better or wrong to right. And the popular success of Steven Pinker's Enlightenment Now, The Case for Reason, Science, Humanism, and Progress, a 2018 book, and Johann Nor Norberg's Open, The Story of Human Progress, a, a book released just this year, su suggests that there is still a market for pro-progress arguments. And you might ask, well, what's wrong with that? Progress, progress is great. Um, and indeed, it is. Um, by and large, the, the authors that I deal with in, in my work don't suggest otherwise. I recently chanced though, uh, upon an interview someone did with the science fiction novelist Ursula Le Guin, conducted shortly before she died uh, in 2018. Le Guin rather pithily sums up the position of the people that I talk about in my work. Um, Le Guin says, I didn't say progress was harmful. I said the idea of progress was generally harmful. And that's a sentiment shared by people uh, that I look at in my work. And these, these figures include um, Arthur Schopenhauer, uh, Leo Tolstoy, uh, Henry Adams, who is the, the great grandson of uh, John Adams uh, and grandson of John Quincy Adams, so um, someone born into a prominent political family. Uh, so a mix of 19th century figures here, and then 20th century figures like Christopher Lash, an American historian, uh, and Alexander Solzhenitsyn, uh, the, the Soviet dissident there. These are some of the, the people that I, I engage with in, in my work who are critical, not of progress itself, but the idea of, of progress for, for various reasons there. Also featured in, in my work are people like Oswald Spang Spangler, um, Nikolai Danilevsky, a Russian theorist, and, and Brooks Adams, the brother of Henry Adams, um, and, and grand, grandson and great grandson of, of two presidents here. Spangler, Danilevsky, and, and Brooks Adams, um, critical of the idea of progress generally, uh, they have cyclical theories instead. And I suggest in my work that a cyclical theory is different from what Schopenhauer or Tolstoy or Solzhenitsyn, for instance, are arguing. Schopenhauer, Tolstoy, um, Solzhenitsyn don't find any rhyme or reason in history. There aren't any patterns. There aren't any great laws. There are maybe periods of advance, maybe periods of, of decline, but there's no pattern there. Uh, and I, in my work, I make the argument that these um, philosophers or historians or novelists who find no rhyme or reason in history, no patterns, um, but dispute the idea of progress, tend to, to be anti-political thinkers in the end. Um, they, their philosophies of, of history lead them in a, in a direction such that they don't see a, a great role for um, politics. Um, on the other hand, cyclical theorists, people like Spangler or Danilevsky, do find a role for politics, uh, especially international politics. Um, so the cyclical theorists may see periods of um, flourishing, in which case they see their particular countries as having a role to play in that period of, of advancement. Or in their theories, they, they might say their, their country has a particular role to, to play in staving off decline. Um, but I paint a, a difference here and, and make a conclusion that there are different critiques of, of progress here. Some lead to an anti-political direction. Some uh, lead to a, a more strictly political direction. Um, the problem with the thing that I've been wrestling with here um, after the, the book's publication. I think we have um, you know, some 
current figures here. Um, my book is focused on, on the 19th and, and 20th centuries, but we have movements on, on the left, like Extinction Rebellion, um, led in part by Rupert Reed, which are very critical of the idea of progress, but nevertheless still political, uh, very much engaged with politics. We also have a cyclical theorist or someone who subscribes to a cyclical theory in Steve Bannon. And Steve Bannon, I would say, is someone who, despite having that theory of cyclical um, change in history, does not fall um, in the side of um, a, a Spangler or a Danilevsky in the end, um, because a Spangler is particularly interested in international relations and sees a role for Germany to, to play on the world stage. Whereas Steve Bannon, Bannon um, you know, whatever the, the many faults of the Trump administration, military adventurism and or you know movement around the world on, on the international stage was not one of the, the features of the Trump uh, presidency there. So in as much as, as Bannon had an influence on, on Trump, uh, it's leading me to, to re-question whether a cyclical theory necessarily leads to um, thinking about um, the, a role for the state that, that engages um, with other states uh, militarily as Spangler's con conclusions led to or Danilevsky's conclusions led to. Um, I'll stop rambling for, for a bit and, and, and wrap it up there and, and let any questions um, pop out. Thanks, Matthew, for an equally thought-provoking talk. And now, uh, I, now we'll have the discussion round. Please type your names in the chat box. Uh, the first person we have is uh, Rastislav. Rastislav, is that how you pronounce it? Sorry. Yes, yes. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, first, I would like to, I would like to uh, thank Matthew on this really, really great talk. And uh, he really got me interested in his book, which I will definitely read. Um, uh, I found the uh, uh, I found the talk very interesting. Uh, I found the I'm not sure about the thesis. I would like to to hear this if, if, apart from the from the from the one that uh, we have a lot to learn from uh, from the critics of of progress. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> I was thinking, so I have one more more like a comment, and then. Uh, and one question. So, uh, when it comes uh, when it comes to the comment, uh, there is obviously this strain of uh, of kind of uh, uh, Marxist uh, leftist uh, critics of progress, right? Uh, uh, ranging from Walter Benjamin and and then uh, on and on. I was uh, I just saw Snowpiercer the movie uh, uh, two nights ago, and I was reminded again of of this famous. Uh, Benjamin's famous claim about how revolution is actually not the locomotive of history, but it is pulling the emergency brake, right? So it is it is stopping this this uh, uncontrolled this uncontrolled progress, right? So this is one one thought that I had, and that's obviously political, right? That that's criticism of progress, but that's obviously political. And uh, uh, so uh, it seems to me that uh, why am I mentioning it? Uh, mentioning it, it seems to me that you didn't mention the, this kind of strain of, of, of criticism of progress. And then uh, there's another uh, thing. L let me put it like. Uh, 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 let Let me try to put it as a question, but I don't know if you share uh, when you mentioned. Uh, uh, I love the Leguin reference, and I think it was very on spot, I share her feelings and I, I share her vision uh, that uh, it is the idea of progress, which is which is uh, basically the problem, not the progress, not the progress itself. And uh, when it comes to uh, these uh, contemporary and popular ideologues of progress, such as Pinker, uh, what really, uh, what really uh, bothers me when I read them I mean, there are many things that bother me, but one of the things that Likewise. really, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, but one of the things that uh, that really bothers me is this almost uh, Stalinist, uh, you know, determinist uh, uh, voice of uh, of uh, historical determinism, and obviously this uh, this dictum 
do not believe your eyes, believe us and do not believe your eyes, right? So it's, you know, there are these, uh, uh, when they ask them, I think it's, it was one of the authors, if it's not Pinker, it's the other guy you mentioned, uh, when they asked him about, but you know, what do, what do you say to people who are losing their jobs in, in, you know, in the Rust Belt in the US because of the industrialization, things are not going good well for them, right? In their, in their, in their uh, experience, uh, we're not progressing, we're regressing. And there are many such uh, there are many such uh, areas around Western and and uh, Eastern Europe too. And where I where I come from, come from, it's it's the same. It's like Yugoslavia and so on. And uh, what do you tell them? And they say and they say yeah yeah. But you know globally stuff is getting better. And there and there are factories in China which are opening up. Uh, I mean it obviously counts for something. And I agree that the local perspective cannot count for everything. But this, this answer, do not believe, you know, this kind of, do not believe your eyes answer is really, really bothering me. And I'm not sure, when, uh, was it always a part of, of, uh, of this uh, progressive discourse of the idea of progress? Uh, or, is it, or is it just a, 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 later, a latest development or a contemporary development in your experience? Thank you. Um, so, the, so the particular vision that's, you know, put forth by, a Pinker or a Norberg or um, you know groups that they're they're affiliated with. There, there's a movement called Progress Studies. They're they're active on Twitter and online and in various spheres. They they have a, a Slack channel. Um, there's also a website that uh, human pro humanprogress.org. Um, and they tweet a lot and they use a lot of visuals to show, you know, one of my favorite visualizations that, that they show is they'll, they'll tweet an image of, you know, this is what the size of what a chicken was in, you know, 1950, but now chickens today are so big and so like, okay, yes, the chicken, so, you know, I, I, I play the role of heckler and, you know, show them, you know, like a, t-rex version of, of the chicken that's you know coming in the future that's going to be further progress there but um you know the the focus on material advancement or, or well-being um and you know ultimately you know consumerism there is that part of of the idea of um progress has it has it always been interwoven that's where you know uh one of the, the figures in my book, Christopher Lash, comes in in his book, um, the, the True and Only Heaven, looks at the idea of, of progress there. And he says that fundamentally is what the, the idea of, of progress has been about um, and, and really has what swayed people since, it, you know, since the Enlightenment. He says, you know, the, the other ideas that we associate with the idea of of progress, you know, maybe something more abstract or noble, you know, ideas of, of equality or liberty or, um, you know, anything like that. Lash says, really what, what garnered people's um, commitment to the idea of progress was belief in, in material advancement and well-being. So Lash is a criti critic of, of that idea. Um, and, and I think several of the, the figures that I talk about are as well, because they have, you know, the perspective here um, that, you know, something that now is considered a need would have in the past been considered a luxury. The fact that we're, you know, the, the advocates of, of progress point to things like, you know, we have ice cream now, whereas in the past only kings could have eaten ice cream. Okay, but as you pointed out, there are still people who, they don't feel that. Uh, and, you know, suicide rates are up. People feel, you know, disgusted with the world. And no amount of figures or charts is going to change how they, they feel there. And I, I think that's something that the the Pinkers or the Norbergs or, or the others are, are missing here. On your point earlier about um, Benjamin and, and some of the, um, uh, you know, more Marxist critiques of progress, you're right. I don't, I don't engage with that literature um, 
in my own work well um, or, or much at all. Um, I, I have read it and I've read, for instance, Amy, Amy Allen has, has a book that, that moves in that direction and engages precisely with, the, with those people. Um, and there's, there's more that I, I should do there to, to update my, my own thesis. So you're absolutely right. And I won't say more beyond that. Very shortly, I, I hope you're aware that there's this kind of a resurgence of, of, uh, of lush studies, right? right exactly yeah, yeah. on the left, right around zero yeah. books. So yeah. great, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Masha next. Thank you so much for your presentation. I'll try to be really quick. Um, I wanted to ask uh, how your project kind of speaks to um, black uh, political thought, uh, American black political thought, who, uh, for example, I'm thinking of books such as um, uh, Hope Draped in Black, for example, or Black Utopia by Alex Zamalin. Um, these thinkers are also kind of um, recuperating a very rich tradition of, um, uh, of, uh, of thinking that is critical of the idea of progress, but do not kind of end up uh, in, in, in an anti-political stance. So okay. I just... um, Thank you. I confess to not being familiar with that strain of literature there. Um, so you've given me a suggestion for, for further reading there. Can't say anything beyond it because I, I don't know the, the literature. So I appreciate that though, really. Um, so I, I will look into it. Okay, so the last question is by Nicholas. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Um, and it might be me, but I'm, but I'm still a bit unclear about how you understand progress. We're working with an opposition between progress and, and uh, the circular. Um, but sometimes you used uh, advancement as more or less synonymous with progress. And I take it that um, it struck me that advancement seems to be a word that fits your view better than progress. <laughs> Uh, because if we take the nature of historical change into account, uh, we're going to have um, problems with the notion of progress because progress seems to assume that, you know, the poles between we move are, as it were, set, that we're dotting to A and A all the time. But what happens with, with historical change, I take it, is that the poles themselves in between which we move are changing or become different, or placed at a different uh, location. So in that way, we, there, there was advancement seems to be the right word or a better word for the moving forward uh, than progress does because progress seems to you know repeat the idea of one idea that we should reach all the time, and if we don't have that idea, if the ideas that we're dotting towards are changing, the notion of progress seems to kind of evaporate, whereas advancement doesn't. So that was my comment. Sure. Um, so how, how I define it or how I use it is in, in some ways, um, I would say um, not really um, what's at stake here, because what I do instead is talk about how other authors have used the idea of progress and what it means to them and how it informs their theories. So for instance, I talk about how, um, you know, Kant and Herder and Fichte and Hegel use the term progress and what it means in their theories. And then how a later respondent, Schopenhauer, talks about that term. So my definition is less, less important here so much as I'm looking at how others have used that, that term, how it influences or undergirds their political theories or philosophies more generally. And that's the same that I do through, throughout the work is explore how other people have used that progress and what the implications were, where, where it landed there. And that's in the end what allowed me to make a, a sort of dichotomy here between the, the skeptics or critics of the idea of progress who having surveyed you know, their, their compatriots or predecessors, earlier thinkers, um, 
come to a critique of, of progress that, that shows they don't think that there's, there are laws in history versus those that do think there are laws in history, but simply find that those laws posit periods of, of rise, decline, rise, decline in, in a noticeable pattern there. I don't know if that's satisfactory in the end um, that I'm not looking to de define in the end progress. I'm more taking what others have done with that protean term there that, that is very nebulous and, and seeing what that impact has, has been um, in, in others' thought. Okay. Thank you both Matthew and Masha. That was really, that was a wonderful session. And now, uh, now I will hand over to Philip who will take care of the next session. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, both uh, Masha and Matthew. Um, very nice session. I really enjoyed it. Um, thank you also, Mati, for the moderation, being the well, moderation, being the moderator, and for the lively discussion. Um, we are now coming to the last segment of this uh, three-day conference. And firstly, I would like to say that I'm happy that there's still. Um, some, many of you left here um, and, and holding on. And um, just very generally, I, I, I would like to say, uh, I would like to say that it's uh, amazing in a way to be able as a group of PhD students to bring together so many smart people uh, and then just listen to them and have them discuss stuff. And this gains its own momentum. And, uh, you know, it's the first conference that I participating in, in organizing. So that was very, very nice to, to have. But anyway, that's not of interest here. Um, so for the final keynote session, I'm very happy and honored to introduce to you Dr. Samantha Ashenden and Professor Andreas Hess, who will talk about the political philosophies of Hannah Arendt and Judith and Schlar. Um, the latter being an up until now, unfortunately lesser known 20th century political theorist, whom Samantha and Andreas will hopefully help to get the attention that she probably deserves. Um, it almost feels superfluous to introduce them to you because they have participated so lively in today's discussions, but uh, just just very few words about them and their work. So um, Samantha, um, or should I say Sam, um, <laughs> is a reader in politics and sociology at Birkbeck College, University of London. She has published on Judith Schlar, Michel Foucault, Jürgen Habermas, Niklas Luhmann, on problems of power, violence, and legitimacy, feminist theory, and other topics. And Andreas is a professor of sociology at the University College Dublin, and his research interests lie mainly in historical, historical sociology and social and political thought. He is the author of The Political Theory of Judith Schlar, as well as Tocqueville and Beaumont, Aristocratic Liberalism in Democratic Times. Uh, Sam and Andreas are both the editors of Judith Schlar's On Political Obligation, as well as on a text between Utopia and Realism, the political thought of Judith and Schlar. Um, so now, before giving the word to Sam and Andreas, I want to note that I have already had the pleasure to be part of a podcast uh, alongside Matti and Patrick, um, in which we interviewed Sam and Andreas on the topic of the let's say, the anti-utopian themes of Judith Schlar's thought. So uh, for anyone who's interested in getting a bit more into that, the link to the podcast is on the conference, pro conference program. Um, but now, without, further ad uh, without any further ado, I give the word to you, Sam Samantha and Andreas, uh, and the talk, Why Virtues Will No Longer Do, Some Pros and Cons of Dystopian Perspectives. So the stage is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I just have to warn you that uh, as we just started to getting our thoughts together here outside, there's some building work going on in the streets and they're digging up the whole paveway, uh, which makes an awful noise. Now for the moment, I see the workers have stopped here. Uh, again, the working class interrupts whenever, exactly when you don't need it. Um, anyway, so um, I hope that, that that you can still hear me loud and clearly. The idea the, we want to do this is, um, we talked about this we, uh, after a long day and after two or three long days of 
listening to each other, I, I think you must be all exhausted. So we thought we'd take on a little bit more con con uh, conversational style uh, where we go back and forth between Sam and myself. We're not going to read from a paper. Uh, we have made notes uh, to which we can always come back to. So we're trying to do this in a more, if you want, Socratic style, and hopefully this will lighten up uh, this a little bit and uh, isn't just a you know, uh, top-down uh, reading from a paper for the next uh, half hour. So, so I said half hour, uh, I think we can do it. Uh, yesterday we had a little test run, so I think we can do it in just above uh, uh, 30 minutes. Um, and the way we do it is uh, I will provide a little bit of historical background and then hand over to Sam. And we're doing this a couple of times and hopefully it will all make sense. Our hope is of course that as usual with any, any of these papers, we produce more questions than answers. I mean, that's probably the nature of the game when you're in, in the social sciences or the humanities, uh, you produce always more uh, question marks than exclamation marks or full stops. Okay, so you, the title has already been mentioned by Virtus will no longer do. And we're looking at some of the pros and cons uh, that come up in various forms and sizes and, uh, and images in, in the work of both um, Skla and Arendt. So the, I, the idea that we refer to the debate between, uh, or the juxtaposition, I should say, between Arendt and Skla is that we don't want to ground our argument in what usually has been called a normative theory. I think I'm, I'm, I'm personally a little bit bored by that kind of approach uh, where you de describe, you know, the, as if the, uh, the rest of the world didn't exist or reality didn't exist. So in a way, uh, the debate between Skla and Arendt channels uh, the debate and focus, lets us focus a little bit more than, this, than that is uh, normally the case. So it's grounded in real historical experience and, and related discussions. So in a, in a way, we think Arendt and Sklar are paradigmatic for some of the debates in the 20th century. And then uh, once I've given my little historical exposition about the constellation, then Sam will come in and try to uh, work on that and give it a, a more theoretical spin of what that all means uh, today and maybe into, into the future. So there's three historical juxtapositions um, that we are going to look at, or, or let's call them constellations. The first one we call liberalism and republicanism, uh, where we think this is in need of a reorientation. And again, we refer to Arendt and Skla here. The second then is uh, totalitarian dystopias and experiences and the search for justice. And the last um, perspective or juxtaposition is that between, uh, is a connection, if you want, between exile, having been a refugee, between notions of citizenship and uh, the perspective of political obligation. Okay, let me start briefly with the first juxtaposition or constellation that of liberalism and republicanism. Now, uh, anybody who has read Hannah Arendt will have noticed that there is a strong uh, opposition in her work between what she calls the political and the social. And in Arendt's book on revolution from 19, 1963, uh, she maintains that there is a profound difference between the French and the American Revolution, both in their historical manifestations and in their perceptions. So the first um, is uh, associated with a political revolution, that's of course the American Revolution, while the second uh, is more a kind of social revolution and associated with the social. And then in Arendt's argument, a uh, number of further juxtapositions come into play, such as the political, first of all, the political versus social equality uh, as acted out by what she calls the homo politicus and the homo faber. And there is, uh, there are other terms that she sometimes uses, citizen versus uh, the notion of the bourgeois. But uh, to dig a little bit further into the French Revolution, so it's mainly social equality, argues Arendt, that is seen as natural um, and causes then, or is uh, the explanation for certain, for acting out, if you want, only what history demands from the people. Uh, so in, if you want, it's re-establishing a, a natural equilibrium with social equality prevails. In America, of course, it's all different. 
it's a language of rights that seems to prevail, or the rhetoric of rights that seems to, seems to prevail um, in uh, the discussion about the American Republic. And for Arendt, it is exactly this lack of the language of rights or the rhetoric of rights in the French Revolution that leads then to a terror and to the instability in the course of the 19th century. As you probably know, I mean, the course of the uh, French Revolution uh, wasn't a happy one. Uh, the French needed another five republics uh, to come to terms uh, with uh, the origins of the French Revolution. And even today, there is still an ongoing debate whether the French Revolution has actually ended or not. Um, and so it had something to do with that missing language of rights that uh, Arendt thought was uh, running throughout the uh, American Revolution. Um, similarly, uh, if you look at the roles of intellectuals in these two revolutions, you find a juxtaposition. So Arendt stresses or says that you can almost um, use two names and see that the, they, they mark the two extremes in the debate. One would be Rousseau yeah, for the French Revolution, and the other one would be uh, the authors of the Federalist Papers for the American Revolution. So Arendt argues that uh, in the US context, intellectuals were a little bit more, um, to use a term from Gramsci, uh, organic, uh, while in France, it was slightly disconnected from politics, which then uh, basically took on a revenge of its own because when they became politically powerful, then they used and abused uh, their position systematically, at least according to Arendt. Now, Skla, partly disagrees with that. She says there are some elements that have to do with exceptionalist conditions, but there are also other things that where she thinks Arendt went uh, over the top with her argument. And she makes that clear by drawing a distinction by using an Amazonian argument between the party of memory and the party of hope. The party of memory basically says that we have to look back into the, the mainly European past in order to find out what went wrong there and avoid anything that just smells of that, those conflicts that they had in Europe. But then you have the party of hope, and of course it's not really a party. Yeah? Um, the party of hope like um, probably enshrined in the words, in the works of uh, Thomas Paine or in the rhetoric of Thomas Jefferson who always thought, you know, we have to have a revolution every whatever 15 or 20 years and things will just be all right. Forget about the past. The past is dead and gone. Uh, the dead don't have a right to determine what's going to happen with the living. But the interesting thing that Skla does here with these two parties is that they're not, of course, parties in the traditional sense as we understand parties, but they are opinions that are being held by individuals. But sometimes you also find a mix between the party of hope and, the, and between the party of memory in one particular individual or in a group of individuals. And for, our, for Skla, this tells us something about the different notions uh, that were in play about uh, republicanism and uh, the further course of the revolu of revolution. So in many ways, Skla is less classicist than Arendt. Um, she's a bit more history conscious um, to see what was new in this project. And there's particularly one figure, uh, it's not the only figure that played a major role, but there is one philosopher, which she thought was differently interpreted in the US context than it was when the early American Republic than it was in France. And that is the figure of Montesquieu, the famous author of The Spirit of the Laws. So in, a, in many ways, Scala understands her work as an application of Montesquieu and of later on of, of Montaigne applied to American circumstances. Okay, one more word briefly about how does liberalism come into that. Uh, you may have heard that Skla coined the famous term liberalism of fear. It's a very unique form of liberalism in that it is uh, not the kind of Whiggish, uh, uh, how can I say, it? the Whiggish um, sense of progress that underlies this, this form of liberalism, but rather it's a defensive one that wants to avoid cruelty, uh, and has a notion of rights that is very different from traditional forms of 19th century or 20th century liberalism. Um, hence also her argument with Isaiah Berlin, um, 
Now, she thought Isaiah Berlin had a totally blind spot when it came to the United States. She thinks in the United States, uh, the, 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 uh, the struggle for rights was a struggle for positive rights, not just a, stride, a, a right for what's, what has been called negative rights. And the positive uh, fight for rights was enshrined in the struggle for citizenship, uh, particularly among African Americans in the United States. Uh, so there's where she totally different, uh, differed from um, Berlin. I hand over now to Sam to provide, if you want, the spin on that. Okay, thank you, Andreas. Okay, so I'm going to try and um, pick up. I did say to uh, Andreas earlier that if, if he's the, the physics, then I'm the metaphysics in the argument, having made that comment about metaphysics earlier. Anyway, um, Hannah Arendt is usually taken as the the kind of Republican writer. And if you put her in a counterposition with Judith Sklar, then you would see Judith Sklar's liberalism come through. So what I'm gonna to try to do is just suggest to you that, that what kind of a liberal, to try to elaborate what kind of a, a, a liberal um, we might take Judith Sklar to be and how that fits with her anti-utopian uh, political theory. So she is, as Andreas um, just suggested, she's best known for that formulation, the liberalism of fear, which most, uh, most academics working in IR take to place her in a kind of in the realist tradition in IR, but it equally as she looks like a kind of a liberal here, she's writing about the liberalism of fear. The root of this in Sklar's work is um, a kind of mature consideration of the whole question of the possibility of progress. And um, referring back to the, the last paper in our discussion, um, a skepticism around progress, a skepticism towards those perfectionist arguments within liberalism that would suggest that, that historical progress is, is always possible. So she comes from a kind of skeptical Kind of position to the liberalism of fear and to liberalism in general. So the flavor of her liberalism is very, it, it's, it's anti-perfectionist, it's focused in fact on um, avoiding the worst. Yeah, the skepticism then kind of feeds an argument for avoiding the summum malum, as she, she puts it, um, and using our um, knowledge of, of, of history, in particular of what's gone wrong in the middle of the 20th century, to think about, well, well, what would we want to avoid? And what we want to avoid, she argues, beyond everything else, is, is fear and cruelty, or fearfulness and, and cruelty. This then, rather than leaving her straightforwardly looking like a kind of liberal political uh, theorist, Andres and I want to argue that actually this pulls her liberal argument back over towards a Republican tradition, but it does so in a way that avoids some of the limits of Hannah Arendt's kind of classical Republicanism. Um, so what Judith Sklar goes on to do is to make an argument, um, the liberalism of fear on the one hand, but the argument that citizenship standing in other words, um, freedom from uh, domination um, is fundamental to, to participation, to being able to uh, properly to uh, participate in any uh, polity. So instead of a, a kind of classically liberal argument, um, what we find in Judith Scar's uh, work is the idea of, of a kind of civic Republican emphasis on freedom from arbitrary power. Yeah. Um, so she's quite close, in other words, to a kind of Republican conception of the political, but keeps her one foot at least in a kind of liberal camp. Now, where that foot is, I think, is, is um, focused on the problems of pluralism that Republican political ideas have, have trouble dealing with. Judith Sklar is a, an anti-communitarian. She is kind of liberal to the core in that sense. She, she uh, would hold on to the idea of, the, the, of individual rights against the collectivity, but at the same time has a positive spin on uh, 
freedom to on, on Isaiah Berlin's distinction. There can't be just freedom from if you're going to build a kind of polity of any sort, not only the American one. Um, and her argument about positive liberty in the Americas is to do with the overthrow of slavery. Yeah, so there's, a, there's an argument that she runs that um, negative liberty doesn't give you an explanation of what's going on in America because it takes a positive struggle to overcome slavery to establish uh, the Republic properly. But when one can equally apply her argument for positive liberty, um, I think in, in European and other contexts as well, and you can use the work of people like Quentin Skinner to sort of argue, well, negative liberty always has kind of positive preconditions, Isaiah Berlin, you know, you need to wake up and smell the coffee. Okay, but so, so what we're interested in doing then is, is taking the, the conventional standoff of, if you like, of, of Arendt as the Republican writer and Sklar as the liberal and saying, well, actually Sklar defies this easy designation. She refuses to sit comfortably in the liberal camp. Um, if you place her in the liberal camp, she's a skeptic. She's someone who's driven toward a liberal position because she's skeptical about progress, because she's skeptical about the possibility of us collectively designating the good for the good way of life. Yeah, so that drives her towards liberalism and the rule of law. On the other hand, she is close to Republican writers in thinking that absolutely central to individual freedom is freedom from arbitrary power and freedom to participate in a polity. I'm gonna hand back over to Andreas and then I'll come back in after you've done the next bit. Yes, so our second um, juxtaposition or constellation that we're going to look at or that we're going to explore is that of what we call totalitarian dystopias and experiences and the search for justice. And here we pair again uh, two and two titles with each other. The fir first pair is that of Arendt's Origins of Totalitarianism, published in 1951, and Sklar's After Utopia, published in 1957. The second one pair being Eichmann in Jerusalem from 1963 versus Sklar's uh, legalism from 1964. So briefly, let me say a few things about the first pair. So in Origins of Totalitarianism, uh, Arendt dissects the argument um, about, um, well, what she calls dystopian ideas, but you know, it's, this, it's utopian for some, it's utopian for the perpetrators, it's dystopian for those who suffer. Um, and as such, he identifies two lines of reasoning uh, in the last chapter, which I think is the most important chapter of that long book. Uh, so she argues uh, one side uh, that national socialism and fascism wants to discover or act out the laws of nature, and the laws of nature uh, are then described uh, usually in, 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 in the terms of racial race and racial formations, while the other set that competes with that is to discover the laws and deal with the laws and apply the laws of history. Um, and that's usually then uh, about class, class struggle and the conflict-free society as envisioned by a particular type of uh, Marxism or Marxism-Leninism, one should say. Now, uh, Arendt then goes a step further and says they share a couple of things. They share their view on mass society. They share a view on mass indifference. They share similar views on dictatorship and the need for dictatorship. And they also talk about, she also talks about the functions of terror and ideology. And finally, the, if you want the incarnation of all that is of course then the, the camp. And we're not just talking about the camp that uh, holds prisoners and puts them to work, but we're talking about camps and where the destruction for the pure sake of destruction is taking place. Now, Sklar's After Utopia has a very different spin. Uh, it focuses more on ideology and ideological content, and it asks what has happened in the course of the 19th century that leads up to that, the 1930s, and what influenced uh, the thinking about totalitarian structures, particularly National Socialism and Stalinism. But secondly, she writes also this book after Utopia because she's interested about how some of these anti-totalitarian writings have been used during the Cold War. 
and she's not always happy the way uh, anti-totalitarian analysis has been used during the Cold War. But basically what she identifies as standing out of not having worked so well uh, in the course of the 19th century and leading up in the first three decades of the 20th century is um, that was marked by utopian reasoning uh, that also took a clearly anti-political stance. And she goes then a little bit through the motions and I cannot summarize the entire book here, just a few keywords. So she criticizes the, 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 the romantic, romanticized notions uh, of what it means to live an authentic life. Um, she, uh, she abhors the radical posturing uh, of some of these thinkers and that might reach from Nietzsche to Sartre. Um, which she is not uh, very happy with. She's also uh, worried about the blindness vis-a-vis um, -vis, um, liberal reforms and uh, some of the tendencies that capitalism has exposed in the course of the 19th century. Um, so she's pretty radical and basically says, you know, all this from extensive existence philosophy to uh, existential philosophy to um, modern existentialism, there is a problem and it's basically uh, their apolitical stance. Um, now, an extension then um, of the debate that I just mentioned is then you find in two other books uh, that I mentioned, Eichmann in Jerusalem and Legalism for uh, Skla. So the question then that, uh, that um, Arendt discusses in Eichmann in Jerusalem is what was so new um, after the bureaucratic mass murder and how can we deal with it if you're interested in terms of putting the perpetrators to justice, which was all, which would of course signal of course what you could do in, in contemporary times at the times of writing her book. Let's briefly recall for Arendt it means uh, so what has happened were crimes against humanity in which bureaucratic mass murder, murder was prevalent. Uh, it's, uh, you can summarize it with the subtitle of the book, The Banality of Evil, uh, enshrined in the person of Eichmann, who personally, uh, you could not link one particular individual uh, murder uh, to his direct involvement. It all happened through basically the writing desk and to giving orders to others. So bureaucratic mass murder for the first time is something that is new in history and needs to be dealt with and dealt with with legal procedures that might not be ready to do exactly that. So in the end, Arendt concludes that it was mainly um, what, the, what the judges had to rule upon was what had occurred for the first time in history, namely a uh, systematic bureaucratic mass murder uh, based on a determined action or a decision-making process, uh, which tried to identify and eradicate an entire people from this earth. Um, I think that's just something we've seen many, you know, uh, we have, seen ethnic slaughter, we've seen other forms of mass murder, we've seen colonialism at work and so on and so forth, but it all does not amount to that kind of uh, division of labor and the bureaucratic mass murder that was uh, applied. Now for Skla, she phrases the, 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 the legal problem uh, very different. She says, why, won't, why, why should we not uh, say it's okay to call a political trial political, she says there's nothing wrong with that. The, the, pre the problem that then arises with political trials is what's with the politics behind it? Is the politics any good? That is the crucial question. So she opens up a new horizon, if you want, and where she looks at the spectrum that ranges from ethical behavior on one side to political trials uh, on the other side. And then she asks, how good are the politics behind, behind that? That's her crucial question. So a very different approach to justice than that we find with, uh, with Arendt. Sam? Okay, I'm going to try to be very brief and I'm going to try to hook this back into the discussion of utopia. Um, 
So, and I and to do so, I'm going to just stick with Judith Starr's legalism and make, I think, one point. Um, so Judith Starr's legalism is a, is a very odd book, um, but the first half of the book is structured around a distinction between, on the one hand, natural law arguments, and on the other hand, legal positivism, both of which are raging in um, American academic life uh, in the post-war world in which she writes the book was first published in 1964, okay? Now, the point that, that one could make, I don't, Scott doesn't put it quite like this in the text, but I think it's the kind of horizon of her argument, is that both of these impulses towards natural law arguments and towards legal positivism, both are utopian. Both, in other words, are deeply anti-political and are attempts to um, immunize legal reasoning from the politics that necessarily contextualizes it, makes sense of it and operationalizes it and so on. And so Sklar's orientation is against that utopianism in legal thinking that would um, inure law against politics and instead of that what she what she argues for as Andreas just suggested is um, for a kind of politics of law um, and uh, this places her I think you know in a very different position from I'm going to make a second point in a very different position from Hannah Arendt who has a virtually kind of law free kind of uh, conception of politics the conception of politics of the ancient polis and my argument would be very bluntly that that won't work in the modern world for all the reasons that have been endlessly enumerated. Yeah. Um, and what Judith Sklar's offering us here is a question of the, the kind of politics of law and how we think about the essential role of, of legal process as a kind of de-dramatizing move in, in uh, modern political systems, but that we should never think that we can simply um, refer things to the law in order to depoliticize them. So she wants to hold on to the politics of law in the face of that in a kind of anti-utopian, it's an anti-utopian impetus that, that drives her argument in that direction. Back over to Andreas. We need to <laughs> leave some time for discussion. Yeah, I think we're, we're still making good progress. Um, well, the third uh, juxtaposition uh, we called exile and citizenship and how it relates to political obligation. Now, both Arendt and Sklar were refugees um, and exiles, and they were so in different ways. I don't want to elaborate too much on this. I've written in, this, in my book about this a little bit more. Uh, for, for the argument now, it doesn't really matter that much. Let's just assume that exile grants you uh, a different observation point, something you weren't looking for, but it helps when you see it. Um, and uh, you can benefit from such insights. It's a epistemological vantage point which allows you to look at things that others don't see. It looks at the blind spots of all this talk about communities and nice polities that we can think of and, um, and how political obligation fits into that. But in Arendt, at least to my mind, and maybe Samantha agrees with that, uh, in Arendt, uh, the sense of political obligation is a mixed one. It is very uneven. Uh, it can range from uh, very positive descriptions about what it means to be a refugee in her essay on we refugees. It's a particularly good text. But later on, uh, when she uh, was asked to comment on various political events in the United States, um, I don't know, I don't see, uh, it's very hard or difficult to see uh, um, a, a clear position emerging. And I think or I suspect it has something to do with Arendt's classicism, uh, the idea that she hangs on to this unspoiled republic and to those moments, those fleeting moments in which, uh, when, when, for example, when she talks about the Hungarian revolution, um, in uh, 1956 and what followed it. I mean, she says she get, again dreams of councils and so on and so forth, but she never raises the question about what would it take to get a lasting achievement in terms of political institutions that you can rely upon, not forever, but you know, uh, I think some security in that respect 
is certainly called for. Now, SCLA is uh, very different when it comes to that. Um, in her last lectures before she died on political obligation, she describes, she follows, um, how can I put this? She looks at um, about uh, roughly 20 examples in from classic times until modern times, and is trying to find out how our sense of political obligation has changed over that long period. Uh, they're thinking pieces in many ways, and she invites students, invited her students at the time to think about those different constellations. And it is very different when you're talking about political obligation and obligation in classic old Greek and Roman times, or when you talk about this in modern times. Don't want to go too much into that. I cut short here and say in modern times, uh, the obligation is not just that you're obliged to do something, but it's the obligation to be just. This is a very, very big difference when compared to classic times. It only occurs in modern times. And so she's onto something here, and then she spells that out in various constellations, what it means uh, uh, when you're obliged to be just. Um, I stop here and hand over to Sam for the last few comments. Okay, thank you. And I'm going to try to kind of um, pull it together by going back to the title of our paper and back to the overall theme of the, the conference. And I just want to say thank you to uh, the organizers of it. I think it's been a, a fantastic event and I'm sorry I couldn't participate in more of it. But um, to finish up our um, paper then, um, I want to go to utopia and virtue or why, why virtues will no longer do and why we thought that was an appropriate title for your conference. And it is, I think, because there is an internal connection between the politics of virtue and ideas of utopia. Um, if we go back to Sklar's book, uh, After Utopia, the, the book that she wrote up following her PhD, she starts off that book by saying, um, you do, it's after utopia okay so so that tells you already what's going on and she links utopia to optimism anarchism and intellectualism um abstract principles that she says um don't operate anymore um and she says there's no law of progress but on the other hand without optimism political theory becomes impossible so she's looking at a kind of a, a situation of wreckage we might add to that that without hope it's it might be impossible to live a life yeah so that's the predicament that she thinks um political theory is in after world war ii in the in the middle of the 1950s so what she then does i think is to chart a course that refuses to um make a political theory hang around abstract principles that always drives back to concrete examples. So some of them are literary, some of them are actually existing historical examples of, of conflicts and so on. And she works a political theory from there, but in the context of after utopia. So this, this is connected then to the skepticism I talked of earlier, but it's also connected to um, really to the heart, what I think is the heart of her thinking, that anti-utopianism is tied to a kind of refusal of the idea of um, politics as unitary. One of the problems she has with natural law arguments is that these propose um, to unify uh, the, the kind of that human stuff is all in the end one thing it's kind of written into into nature or into tablets of stone and so on she stands resolutely against that and for the difficult stuff of working out in a conflict filled way or rather multiple conflict filled ways how we are supposed to live our lives with one another after utopia um, and this I think has enormous resonance with the, with the last paper and enormous resonance for our present because one of the ideas that um, makes her skeptical of progress one of the things that makes her skeptical of the idea of progress yeah which is what runs through after utopia is that progress inures us to the recognition of cruelty um 
yeah, there's it's it's if as long as we can talk about uh, being on the path of progress, then actually a bit of kind of slaughter here and there is by the wayside. And this is something that she resists. Yeah, cruelty is cruelty. And and if you dress it as kind of sort of world historical progress, yes, it's still cruelty. So she's against um, that that she's against a utopianism that would license uh, cruelty. Um, she's also um, then um, focusing in on, on the worst and, and trying to work out how to avoid it, that, that kind of emphasis on, on fear and cruelty and a kind of uh, thinking from the worst case scenario rather than building an account of the good. So we have, I think, in Judith Glass' work then, um, an anti-utopianism that feeds the centrality, the argument for a centrality of politics. So to quote from the very end of After Utopia, she says, intellectually, there's no escaping politics. The question then that she leaves us is how do we maintain, sustain or build uh, a kind of politics worth having? I think it kind of, it, it pushes us back into, into politics rather than anti-politics. And I think her view of utopia was that this was rather an anti-political uh, project. Okay, end. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Sam and Andreas, for this uh, intellectual ping pong play back and forth. And uh, uh, it definitely, um, it, it was definitely very. Um, uh, I don't know. The, this back and forth itself kind of. Uh, made it very lively, and that that was something uh, I, I really appreciate here. So thanks for this. So um, it seems like um, there's already a question uh, from uh, Rastislav. So I'll just give the word to you. Thank you, Philip. Thank you, Andreas and Sam. This was a really, really, really great, uh, great lecture, and uh, it, it was all, all all the better for for being done in in a duet, right? But. Um, uh, so there are a lot of questions that uh, that I that I have connected to it, but I'm going to only ask only one. And um, uh, uh, since I actually had a, a lecture yesterday, and I mentioned at one point uh, uh, at the very at the end point, uh, actually there, um, an important part was played by uh, uh, Stanley Cavell's letter to Alceste, uh, uh, Moliere's hero, right? And it was uh, written. Uh, in a kind of very constant dialogue with uh, with Judith Clare, uh, who also wrote on on Alceste in in uh, in her uh, Ordinary Vices book, right? And it seems to me that it is very uh, very much uh, uh, to the point uh, uh, of uh, her anti-utopianism, and uh, when she. Uh, uh, Sam at one point said that uh, characterized uh, Sklar's views as, as very mature, as a kind of mature vision of politics. And I think this is a great, this is a great point. And uh, I think this anti-utopianism is very strongly connected to this vision of maturity, to kind of leaving away childish things, especially, and no, maybe not even childish, but uh, especially specifically adolescent things, right? Because adolescence is this comes with its own vision of purity, uh, anti-hypocrisy that is that is actually uh, uh, Alsace's vice, right? E everyone is a hypocrite and uh, everything is hypocritic and all the adults are hypocrites and uh, it is obvious why in politics this is such a problematic view because you cannot make any important distinctions because the only distinction you can make is between the world and, and this perfection, utopia and so mm. on. But then uh, you have this Cavell's kind of uh, uh, rejoinder, who it's not that it's not that he's exactly disagreeing with her. Basically, her view of Alceste is that he's a nuisance. You know, he's almost she gives him some credit. You know, he brings out something. You you need these guys in, in society because they bring out some some inconsistencies in society and so on. But he's a nuisance. You know, he's unlo unlovable. And uh, he's, uh, there's nothing you can do with him in society, right? And Cavell basically agrees. Like he says, yeah, he has to grow up, obviously. These guys have to grow up. And 
it's also obvious that they're not just talking about Alsace, they're talking about student politics at the time, right? They're talk, talking about student protests at the campus, they were friend, colleagues at the campus and so on. But then he says, yeah, but this adolescent point of view is extremely important. If, if uh, everyone actually needs a recognition from this guy, and if we don't get the recognition from this guy, something wrong is going on with, with society. Adolescence is this period where we are actually consenting to the society, right, we live in. And if you do not get recognition from, from uh, this adolescent perspective, you cannot get it if it stays completely adolescent. But there is something you have to offer him. There is something you have to offer to this perspective. And if you do not do that, then you're failing. You cannot get real consent. And for a liberal society, which is based on consent, this is a failure. So my question is, how do you, uh, how do you see her view of, of, uh, uh, of, of Alsace and of this position and also of this kind of, kind of rebellious politics and uh, uh, especially in the US of her time? Thank you. Sam, you want to go first? I can do. Thank you. Great question. Um, so, I mean, and this, this I think, connects up with the um, discussion of the relationship between uh, emotion and, and politics earlier today. Um, I mean, Judith Scar was not, she wasn't a great supporter of the student movement, uh, it has to be said. Um, on the other hand, I'm just thinking about her her comments on she's not she's not someone either who thought that um, she wasn't a rationalist either. Yeah? So she didn't think in the end that there was a way in which we could completely ground our politics. Um, in fact, she says at one point in a paper with the snappy title Decisionism that actually we, one can be far worse, you know, decision in, decisionism in politics, one can do far worse, far worse than this. So she's, she's not, so I'm, I'm trying to kind of work out how to, how to respond to your observation. I think you're on, on a, it's a very interesting question. Yeah, it's the, the kind of, mature elder stateswoman of, of politics and there's the kind of you know there are the the students in the street and yeah she didn't think much of as adolescent rebellion but at the same time I don't think she would she would kind of completely be closed to the idea that actually people get out onto the street when they are moved to do so yeah and she wasn't she wasn't dim to the fact that it is people's feelings that animate their political protests. It's just that it can't remain, if it remains like that, it will end in blood, I think is what Judith Sklar would say to you. So actually you better find some um, kind of machinery of politics to properly translate that into some terms that mean that we can kind of work out ways of living with one another. Otherwise we'll end up with kind of blood, which she wanted to avoid. Just, just briefly to add to that, I mean, it also depends on the the quality of utopia. Not all utopias are alike. Uh, and so mm -hmm. that needs to be stressed here. And there's a fantastic, in the first lecture of the, the set of lectures in political obligation, where she talks about, she, she juxtaposes two people, um, Bonhoeffer, uh, the theologian, and uh, Weizsäcker, the son of the, uh, sorry, the father of the uh, later president of the Federal Republic of Germany, who were, uh, who, who were Weizsäcker had been in the docks there for collaboration with the Nazi regime. And she, of course, sides with Bonhoeffer, as one would expect. But she gives very good reasons. Although she is not a believer at all, she thinks his way of thinking about a Christian life had a utopian element in it that was worth fighting for. Uh, while the silence of, Weizsä of uh, von Weizsäcker, who was also a Christian, but he was more a kind of Lutheran type, yeah, um, the one who rather obeys than uh, than than uh, rallies the troops. So, um, so here you have it in a nutshell, yeah, utopia versus something else. So it depends on the quality of utopia as well. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I was just struck, just one short comment. I was struck, I, I went to this uh, Museum of National Socialism in Munich uh, a few years ago. It's a great museum and one of the best archives that there are about you know, National Socialism in Munich and they have a collection of photographs, documents and so on. And one whole floor is, is uh, about people who resisted Nazism and about the resistors. And one of the, uh, one of the strongest and they're very various bunch and there you know you have these guys who are complete leftists you had feminists you had gay activists you had this weird kind of conservatives christians royalists so very very different but but what is one thing that connects them is they were all really very idiosyncratic types very alsace types right very types who really didn't fit into their society even if they were conservative they were this weird kind of conservative and so on and so on so there is something uh, uh, you reminded me with this bonhoeffer uh, hoffer uh, uh, comment thank you so much thanks thank you very much uh, rastislav and now the next question is from patrick uh, thank you very much. Thank to, thanks to you both again for hearing you speak. It's very nice. Um, I think I can give you just a quick question and, and uh, hopefully it's a good question, but we'll see. Um, I, I just started thinking about the idea of open borders and uh, I was just curious uh, what, what the two of you thought, either your own thoughts, but also uh, if there's anything in the commentary of Judith Sklar or in her writings um, that would be, that would advocate for this concept. Um, and uh, the, because I do think of it as, I, I believe it's kind of considered something utopian, this idea of open borders. But I feel like Schlar would actually have, a, there's also a very practical element to the idea of open borders, especially as it applies to Schlar and her philosophy, because as an exile and as a refugee herself, um, uh, and as someone who also uh, wrote about and spoke about uh, the value of citizenship, um, so since she was, she did have these experiences and she, she was concerned with the focusing on the elimination of cruelty, however it appears, I just wonder what she would have thought or, or what you'd think about what she might've thought about uh, the idea of open borders. And of course there being then a sort of citizenship of the world. And if that actually would act as some type of uh, insul uh, insulation against a one layer of cruelty. So thank you very much. Sam, can I yeah. go first? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, one thing can certainly be said and that she would not have supported the building of walls or the erection of walls anywhere on the globe. I mean, you can take that for granted. Um, but beyond that, then it gets, uh, it gets more complicated. I think she would uh, definitely support, and that's what she liked about the United States then, yeah, maybe not today, then was that it allowed uh, many refugees and many immigrants to come, um, which has now, you know, that kind of uh, utopia. Let's say, uh, realist utopia is uh, has been has been damaged, uh, not just in the United States, but I mean, just look at Europe. I think I think Europe paints an appalling picture in terms of uh, being a safe haven for refugees. Um, I, I I am upset. Uh, as a European citizen, that we shut ourselves off from have no forms of first of all uh, regular immigration, just you know, just for work purposes and make a livelihood. That's one thing. But secondly, we don't have a good system or any system that would work for political refugees, and particularly not when they come in mass from Syria and other parts of um, North uh, North Africa. So, you know, I'm appalled by that, and so would be. Uh, uh, Judith Sklar, but would she go for the other extreme, uh, i.e. no borders, uh, free flow for all? I think she would think if you have no borders at all, uh, that would maybe lead to th the destruction of the very reason why people come to certain countries, uh, or at least make it, make it very problematic. Um, so she would argue for a good immigration system and a good system to have refugees and to bring them in. Um, but she would also argue that, you know, there are certain things that should apply in this case. It's not free borders for, you can move around wherever you want to go and settle down. It sounds nice, but, you know, I didn't think it's a, 
realistic option for all kinds of reasons. I mean, and lots of nasty people out there, right? Um, so you, you want to make sure that you, uh, and then some kind of evaluation probably will have to happen. Um, I mean, I just hope that it's fair, you know, that it's transparent, that it saves as many people as possible. Um, I mean, that would be, I think, a sclarin answer to your question. But would it mean, you know, that you totally open up the abolishment of borders? I would be skeptical about that. Thank you. Okay, Thank just you. to follow up, I, I'm, I agree with Andreas's sort of sense of, of where, um, how she probably pitched an argument back to that question. Um, I think also this is where the argument for the politics of law um, is being quite creatively used in the present. Um, so uh, part of the argument of legalism is addressed to international law and the politics of law in the international context immediately after World War II um, in the context of um, judging uh, crimes against humanity and so on as, as uh, new crimes uh, on the international statute book, if you like. And I think the idea of the summer malum and of, of cruelty and, and so on provides a kind of um, a way of pushing those international legal instruments and attempting to push that agenda. So I agree with Andreas that she would not, I think, simply say, well, just abandon borders, but that she would say we need a better and more robust international system and we can really um, push this along a lot further. And there's a, a, a scholar in, uh, in my affiliated to Birkbeck who's working on exactly using Judith Sklar to think about genocide in the present, um, Philip Spencer is writing a book about genocide to, to think about how um, her idea of the Summa Malum makes sense of that. So I think that's where you could see Judith Sklar having a, a kind of something positive to say about the problems of the present when it comes to statelessness. Thank you very much. So and now on to the last question on the list, at least now. Maybe there will be another one. Let's see if we have the time. But anyway, now, Aneta, it's your turn. Thank you. And thank you for this presentation. It was really, really good. I, I just would like to ask because um, or maybe it will be it's short question and kind of like simplifying. But you use a lot to terms. It was just and legal when you speak about this clear philosophy. And I would like to ask if you could clarify somehow how they work together for, for, for their, if they are some kind like a mesh or how, 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 how she sees these two terms working together. Thank you. Sam? Okay. Um, just, I think, I think you'll find Andreas is just more than I did. I tend not to use just when I talk. <laughs> um, but um, Scar, of course, wrote um, a very good book called Faces of Injustice, which is in part a reply to John Rawls theory of justice, um, and which is an argument for, for resisting the urge simply to see injustice as a lack of justice applied. So I think she's more interested in injustice than injustice in justice per se. Yeah. So it's again, it's a kind of negative criterion. It's it's injustice and what does it look like? And injustice can have kind of multiple lives. It can look in in it could, there can be multiple forms of injustice, and we shouldn't simply regard injustice as the inverse of justice as, as justice denied it has a its own kind of life so i think she's a very interesting thinker on injustice um yeah rather than on justice and then the term legal um she's referring uh, she she's one of the few political theorists in the post-war world who paid serious attention to what legal reasoning and jurisprudence, but also the practices of courts mean for our politics 
And so when she refers to um, things legal, she's referring really across the spectrum from, from actual court decisions through to the jurisprudence that's, that's surrounding her as she's teaching in the Department of Government and she's kind of listening to um, you know, the debate between the kind of uh, natural lawyers and the positivists going on um, down the corridor. So, um, so it's, it's across the range from, from actual legal uh, courtroom battles and, and decisions and so on through to, to jurisprudence. I don't know whether that helps to kind of clarify that question. Andreas. Can I just, can I just briefly come in and just add to that? Uh, I mean, one of the great aspects of this relatively short book on Faces of Injustice is the way she talks about victims and victimhood. I think we can, this, this is one of the best passages in the book where she basically, I mean, to summarize briefly, she says, yes, we have to listen more to the victims uh, in whatever victims of injustice and give them more credit, open ears and everything. At the same time, this should not ever lean us to think that victims are better human beings. Uh, very often the process by which they became victims has damaged victims. So uh, it, there's nothing nice of having been a victim. And there's nothing to celebrate of having been a victim. Uh, you have to listen to them and you have to record them and you have them their true voice, yes but that doesn't make them better human beings. And I think she is arguing against the kind of victimology that I partly hear also by all these new identity discourses and the culture wars that go on in the United States uh, and the standpoint epistemology uh, to open up another debate here. I don't wanna, you know, I mean, this we're all entering a different planet here, but um, I mean, she would warn against the idea that because once a victim, you are a better person. Uh, she would be seriously worried about that kind of victimology. Okay, thank you very much. And I just saw that uh, there's a question from Vladimir uh, that just trickled in. So I think we still have another few minutes of concentration for him. <laughs> thank you. Um, Actually, I just want to refer to your comment a little bit earlier about the co connection between roles and and uh, and the theory of justice. And uh, you have said that uh, that uh, she wasn't really interested in in the, th the theory of justice as such, but injustice. Mm -hmm. And while I was thinking about roles for quite a while now, and I can't really see, I can't, I, I just want, I would just like to ask if you can expand a little bit more on that thought, because I can't really see in which way uh, injustice wouldn't be connected or wouldn't be a direct correlation to the principles of justice. Because when I think about it, of course, Rawls is an institutional philosopher and every ju justice resides within the institution, within the institution. And I, I can't really see any any form of injustice which isn't correlated directly to the institution. Thank you so kindly. Can I just come in first and give a short answer and then Sam maybe with a longer answer. I mean, the difference between the two is, by the way, they were friends. They met almost daily for coffee and were well connected. And uh, there's some correspondence in the Harvard archives about their friendship, which is quite really, really moving. But apart from that, they also disagreed on almost everything. Um, so they disagreed particularly on the question of systems building. And uh, this was one of the things that, uh, I mean, Sklar said, you know, any kind of system building around the great notions, I mean, is bound to fail. Uh, she got great respect for this kind of theoretical edifice, which is, I mean, amazing. Uh, anybody who's ever re read Rawls will agree with that. But at the same time, it leaves you worrying. You know, I mean, have you ever thought about the fact that uh, so Skla would argue, yeah. So I'm just kind of trying to uh, trying to uh, interpret it here. Have you ever thought about the fact that the theory of justice is entire politics free? There's no politics in this. It's administration. There's no politics whatsoever. I mean, that would worry me, quite frankly. And so Skla was worried as well. Okay. To follow on from that, um, so. Theory of justice has this great uh, capacity to 
be picked up and put down anywhere. Um, it's contextless. Um, it, the, or rather, the original position, the veil of ignorance, work to produce disinterestedness by refusing the idea that I kind of I I have any baggage that I can know I can carry into the future. Um, Judith Sklar's Faces of Injustice, I think one of the, the best hooks between theory of justice and faces of injustice will be the chapter in Faces of Injustice called Misfortune and Injustice, where she, she simply takes apart the idea that there is a clear line that we can draw between misfortune and injustice. And she says, this is always a political distinction. It depends, it depends on our, partly upon our epistemological resources. Yeah. What counts as, as and this refers back to the, the discussion of disability earlier today. Yeah. What, what in one period of time is just a kind of matter of fate becomes potentially remediable in another. The distinction between misfortune and injustice moves. Yeah. So, so this implies that, that Rawls is uh, veil of ignorance is making his argument immune to the the historical uh, ways in which you know, being a human is different in different moments of time and and this is I think so that's that's how I would start to get a hold of how these two these two operations of thought are they are at really odd angle to one another um, you know they're they're really rather fundamentally different in their assumptions um, and so they're they're neither direct they don't directly kind of clash they're it's more like they're a, they are at an odd angle to one another and you, they can't be reconciled with one another I think um slow and rules thank you very so kindly it, 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 it's a really interesting thought thank you so with this I think we've come to the end of our question list um yeah, it's rarely the case that I'm much more awake after a, a session like this than I've been at the beginning. And it's even more uh, seldom the case that I'm much more awake uh, at the end of a three day conference than at the beginning, but it's the case now. So I guess that can be taken as a big compliment, uh, both to you, Andreas and Sam, uh, as well as to everyone here um, who contributed uh, in the discussion, but also who just listened. Um, yeah. One last final thank you from my side for this. This was very wonderful. And I think I will just give over to Patrick for some last words uh, before we shall depart and go our separate ways. Uh, yes, well, that, this is the end of our conference. Um, I pasted the links I've pasted many times into the chat. If anyone wants to download the conference program one final time um, through that, of course, you can you can uh, reach out to the people who's, who's maybe you weren't aware of how you could contact before. Um, you can learn more about the Center for Ethics of Study and Human Value. We're based out of Pardubice in the Czech Republic. Um, it's, been a, it's been a really wonderful time and I'm really grateful for all the people who presented and also uh, attended and participated in, in the discussions of the entirety of the conference. Um, uh, the PhD students here at the center organized this uh, for better or worse, I think it turned out really good. So. Um, I, uh, yeah, and they're actually from Philip. He just posted the uh, essay from which we read of Andreas and uh, Sam, uh, in which we gave our uh, podcast that we listened to. Their essay is linked there below too. So that's all from me. Uh, if anybody else wants to say anything, I'll leave the link open for a few more minutes. We don't have to all scream our final goodbyes at the same time, but I guess we could just give a final round of applause to the speakers and the pres presenters. And, um, and everyone who's attended. Thank you guys very much. We really appreciate it. May I suggest a round of applause for the organizers? Well, we've done a fantastic job. Thank you, Nicholas. Thank you.